Hi, this is Cindy and Michael from Part Time Permies and hello everyone in the room. Looks like your mom's here already. She's the first one to greet you, huh? So. She's probably just sitting there doing other stuff, I'm yeah. guessing. On the computer. And how to fake your dreams. Yeah, let's do Linda Taylor and Kitty Bug. Yeah, and, and I'm sure there's other people that haven't checked in yet. Yeah, and then Curie from Built on the Rock Homestead. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. Um, so welcome, welcome um, to another show. Can we get a verification of soundcheck? It looks like we have a sound, but I always like to double check that from you guys. Um, and I know there's usually a little bit of a delay going on as well. So hopefully we'll get a few more people in the room as we get started. Uh, let's see how many people. Oh, Green so, Ravens here. Been out for a couple weeks. Hello. Yep, hello. a lot going on with holidays and yep. people doing stuff. So there are nine people in the room. So there's a few more. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been pretty busy. Uh, we were both out this morning, early in the morning. So moving chickens every Sunday morning, just about. Yeah, we've really, been trying to get up. Real early to move the chickens. Yeah, before they start going nuts in there. It's kind of hard to do it Saturday night. Yeah. And so it seems like it's working. But we were doing it Wednesday because so Cindy has an early early yeah. morning and an early afternoon. But she isn't getting home as early. And I'm running yeah. a market. Yeah. It's crazy. So I get home like 3.34. <laughs> Excuse me. Depending on what else I have to do uh, on the way back because it's an out-of-town market. <laughs> but I'm pretty tired because I've usually been up at four in the morning. So moving chickens at dusk is not. And so the nice thing is we figure out we can leave them in the in the coop. In the yeah. coop. Yeah. Um, and they make a little noise, but they're just fine. As long as we get to them, like, not too far yeah. after sunrise or around sunrise, then. City they... was always concerned that they'd freak out. But they really, when we move them up 20 feet, well, 50 feet, they don't do much. No, no. I mean, we move them like one uh, width of the fencing. So yeah. we're not moving them far. But my main concern was if the tail, uh, the, the trailer hitch connection doesn't hold on very well. So if it actually let go, it would do this and you have 20 chickens and they're laying on top of each other. Well, they're all on back anyways. <laughs> they'll figure it out. They'll fly. Oh, yeah, yeah, they'll fly. There's not much room in there to fly. But anyway, we have a few pe more people checking in. We have. Well, Linda's got new chicks coming up today, tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, fun. We've got some of a rooster. I mean, a rooster. We've got a hen sitting. <laughs> we have a rooster sitting. No. <laughs> yeah, we do have a hen sitting on a dozen eggs and a fake egg because she keeps pecking at me when I try to go in there. So I gave up on trying to get the fake egg out from under her. Um, but she has a dozen real eggs, too. So. And we do have a number of other people joined in. So let's see. Who did we say? We said Bree half, and Half Acre, yeah. Tina. Tina. Um, I think it was Linda in here earlier. I think so. Yeah. I yeah. Think so. Okay. I think that's about it. Second Half Homestead. Oh, yeah. The new, are you new? Second Half Homestead? Cool. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah. Uh, so we were doing that. In fact, I actually did get a picture of Mike. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, Moving chickens, moving the, the nursery coop. So that is our nursery coop that we have a uh, silky mom with two, uh, they got to be about six, they're eight pretty, week They're old getting pretty bad. Chicks. They're eating like crazy. They're, uh, they're eating more than Gus and the rooster combined. Oh, yeah, almost twice. Gus is the goose, by the way. Well, One they're not, for, well, they're foraging because we are moving them almost daily, pulling them yeah. forward. So they're foraging that area a little bit. And we're feeding them. Aggressively, yeah, they're hungry. Yeah, quite a bit. We're you know for chicks, we feed them as much as they want to eat. We're on the back end of the grassy property now for the last couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, first time through it last year, it really got beat up with the heat, and we left them there a long. I think they were through there twice, but we left them there a little too long. Yeah, they really ate everything. I was concerned about stuff coming back, so we gave it a long time. The yeah. forage stuff we put in there on the way back didn't grow too no, much due to much. the shade, and it's a real. But a lot of the dry. wild plants came back. But the wild plants, yeah. So we have a pretty high, and we're starting to get a lot of um, summer flowers are just starting to come up. Absolutely. So there's a pretty good mix of things for them to eat, and they're on it for about seven days, and then we move them. So they only, par in fact, the first group of Gus and the Silkies hardly, don't eat a lot of eating. it. So we put the main flock sometimes on top of that the next week. 
and they still don't quite eat everything down, so it, it isn't really damaging it. Yeah. And they may go through there one more time this, and you know, in the yeah. fall. And yes, half fake your dreams. I built that. Um, I built two of these. One I built with my dad, but the first one I built on my own. This is kind of taken from the Saladin idea in one end, um, and also semi from uh, some stuff of Jeff Lawton's I saw. But on the one end, it's basically eight uh -oh. feet long, um, two feet high, three feet wide, and uh, most of it has uh, hardware cloth on the end that Mike's holding. I did stagger the eight foot post, so it's not quite eight feet long, I guess. The eight foot post so that you can hold on to them at the top at the one end, and they do stick out at the bottom at the other end. Um, and then the coop area is just has a board in the bottom to keep it off the ground, but is the nesting area for mom. And the roof is on hinges, so it actually lifts up. Uh, so you can access from the top there. Well, and you have three three more chicken tractors in the yard also. That were I do. Three other designs that we're using. Yeah. But Tina was actually asking about this one. That is the nursery coop. Yeah, so there's um, two of those. Two of those. We probably, before next year, we'll need some more of them if we're going to do more meat chickens. Well, you're going to build a... I'm going to build a big one. Big one, which will cover that. I'll for do, meat chickens. Yeah, a little more salad and style, eight by eight probably for meat chickens. But if we have more of our hens raising chickens that we'll be using for meat, I will keep it on the small end. Um, so it depends on how many broody hens we get. We didn't get many broodies this year. Nope. Or many that stayed broody. <laughs> which is why we need to get some meat chickens, which we've never done because yeah. we missed. Yeah. We missed having chickens ready to raise them. There is not a video on that coop. Definitely the next one I make, I will make a video on. But that was made, I think, before we started doing videos. Um, I could do a video summarizing it um, and how it works and what, you know, it's pretty easy. It's simple. Um, but I will, I was planning on making one this spring. So I was going to do a video on that this spring, but that didn't happen. So the next one I do for the meat chickens, I will do probably have a similar kind of setup, but wider. Um, something we might be able to pull with the tractor, drag along with the tractor and shift it like one length at a time that way. It'll probably be a little heavier uh, for, you know, pulling by hand. Uh, this one that we use for the nursery coop is uh, fairly heavy if you have to go a long distance, but not bad if you're only yeah, going I mean, like a length. It's not, it doesn't have any wheels or sled on it, so what kind of does slides? Yeah. It's not too bad, but yeah, it's a... It's, uh... It's a chick shaw, but it's not the, it's, it's draggable. It's just not yeah. super easy. It probably, I don't know, weighs, if you lift it up, which we never do. No. It probably weighs 100 pounds-ish, maybe a little more. I would think a little bit more, but uh, yeah. yeah. So depending on the how rough the soil, you, you can drag it. The problem is yeah. you can't drag it fast if, with the chickens in it because they get trapped. They get, they hang out, especially this group, they like to hang out back at the back so end. You can't so get any momentum. You have to do little little but, jerks, which is actually a lot harder than actually get once you get the thing moving, yeah. you could run it across the ground pretty easily. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, that's true. And trying the other trick to it is you're lifting up slightly at one end to drag it. Um, and small chicks can run right out from under there. So if you have a bunch of chicks in there, it's actually a challenge to keep it low enough that the chicks don't run out from under, but you can still get pull up pull up enough to get um, relieve some of the friction that you get from pulling it uh, so it is easier it's part of the reason why I staggered the the horizontal beams is so that when you lift up you're on the edge in the back um, and you can pull it easier that way but pretty simple design in general uh, I think the most complicated thing is the roof hinging which is not hard um, the hardest thing I find about putting those together is just dealing with the hardware cloth, which I can't stand because I always get scratched up when I deal with that stuff, but it works and it keeps predators out. So you don't actually have to be within a poultry net with that at all, uh, because yeah, it sits flat some, on the ground. We've never had any problems. You'd have to have, 
You'd have to have a raccoon or a coyote or a dog really go, and they could tear it apart, but they'd really have to go at it they, hard. I don't even know if they could. They couldn't tear apart the uh, they hardware cloth. They might get cloth. the plastic off. The they might get the plastic off, it. but I actually put the hardware cloth around the sides oh. all the way around. Oh, in that case, they might. So yeah. it's under the plastic siding, not under the roofing. They could get the roof off if they really tried hard, or they could dig under. Um, but yeah, so anyway, that's where we're at. Um, and Tina was gifted another chicken yesterday, golden lace coaching. That's cool. Um, fun to get new breeds and see what they're like. Um, for anybody who's in our area right now, I don't know. Um, I don't know how many people logged in right now or in our immediate area. Our 4-H fair started, uh, today. Yeah. Slow started yesterday. Today was check-in. Yeah. So all week through next Saturday is our local Van Buren 4-H yeah. fair, which we usually go out to just to look around uh, one evening or something just for a few hours. Or yeah. But our Saturdays are booked. So the, the And sometimes we go on Wednesday on that early day, but pretty tired. So my yeah. guess, oh, and I have I have events all week. So it's going to be hard. To we're going to be there. lucky if we make it out Saturday night after markets, yeah. um, get a nap and maybe next Saturday night, we'll go out for a few hours at the very end. But that's it. A lot of the, a lot of the animals at that point have already been auctioned off and, or, you know, have been, some of them hang out. They're supposed to, but if people have picked them up after auction or if they're concerned, because it's going to be really every year, it's really hot. It's either really hot and really yeah. muddy or it's just really hot, which means everybody struggles. The kids are all struggling with, watering and feeding and close proximity and, and keeping, keeping the animals cool, cool. It, yeah they really they really struggle so uh, by saturday sometimes the pens are a little sparse as people are just trying to salvage animals, especially the big animals uh if they there's, clear a, everything if there's out, a problem yeah. like with a horse or the cows or whatever they will take them off property and bring them back home because the animals get so stressed and they they yeah. you know they'll, the chance of losing a horse or a cow is catastrophic you can deal with a chicken but, um, yeah. Oh. Um, oh, and I did want to mention, oh, I didn't change that. I did get a video out. Apparently I didn't get this picture updated, but it takes me two seconds to do that. Um, did get a video out this morning on the spring garden, which actually was a hit. I've been filming this all spring and I meant to put like, put this together multiple times, but I did get kind of a summary of what's been going on all spring and put this video together so if you haven't checked it out it's basically our june tour at this point with little clips from earlier in the year on what's growing and such um and it basically rained from may until about a week ago it's going to get hot a couple and weeks ago. may start to dry up we're just starting to dry out a little bit yeah now that we are in the middle of july yeah uh we're starting to dry out although we're looking at a real hot and possibly a um dry spell coming up yeah. here but uh no it, it's like we had three months of april showers and then suddenly we're in august so <laughs> that sounds about like michigan just to go from extreme to extreme but um the so t reading tina's comment here the silky mom let the full-size goldie who is boss she was like a vicious attack dog wow hmm. um so yeah, thanks. Uh, it is a longer video. It's under 20 minutes, but it's on the longer end. Um, We've moved a lot of stuff to a lot of things. Yeah, last, yeah. I mean, we well, started a couple months. recording that in April. So I had some from April and some from early June and then some from later. And Puddin is... What are you doing, Stretch Dog? <laughs> you think about coming to visit? No. Going to go switch beds, I think. Um, but Puddin appearance... Puddin's happier because we got the air conditioner fixed at the beginning yes. of the week. We went yes. week and I'm a half happier. where it was fairly hot, or at least we had some really humid days where yeah. we don't run the air conditioner on this side of the house. It's a oh. different unit, and we don't usually turn it on. But uh, the ones by the bedrooms, when it's hot and humid, so uh, we shut it off because it cooled down for a day or so. And then yesterday, uh, we turned it back on because it was getting hot. <laughs> so. Yeah, which I'm and we're heading into a hot week, so we're like, all right, let's get the house hot cool, and humid, cool week. down, and take the humidity out for this next week or so. I'm happier with AC on, but so. yeah. Um, so put it, pudding's happy. Yes, pudding's much happier and sleeping. So we do have. I don't know if you can see in this, but we'll pull it up in this bag. Um, 
I guess not this year. Last year we did a, a video in the spring on bagging our apples. And we did the same thing this spring. So this is our apples are starting to grow and get a little, oh, they're about an inch and a half on the bigger ones, I would say. Um, and like so, they're doing all right. You lose some, but some of them were probably infected by plum coquilio before we got but the that's bag That's more on. of a, the plum coquilio uh, doesn't um, doesn't really damage the fruit. It leaves a mark. It leaves a mark, but it, no, it does actually pull in and disform the fruit. It does. Um, it, it compresses yeah. it, but it, it doesn't make it unedible. It makes no. it not high quality for sa for retail sale. Yeah. But it's not the worst thing as far as damage to an apple yeah unless you have a lot of it in there but um Puddin was right behind me the whole time <laughs> yep um so and we did also start a raspberry harvest finally we started your reading comments aren't you yep um we started we finally got our first we should have gone out there and gotten more today but i'll do yeah, it in the morning them. Yeah, we... i'll go back out in the morning but we did They're get... ripening fast they are ripening very fast now. They're about two weeks behind as well. Um, the strawberries just ended like last week. And the dewberries are just about to start. Like some of them are actually starting, I think, to ripen up right now. So I think the ras black raspberry and dewberry yeah. season is going to overlap this year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It took, a, it took us a week and a half to get out of the local repair guy. There's com I didn't realize the company that comes out to do our... Our furnace and AC is, this, I guess there's only three people working with them. There's mm -hmm. the, the main guy who's older, and he's got two other people. I thought they had a few more. I know they're a smaller local company, but they do a pretty good job. They yeah. Sometimes I feel like they're a little overpriced, but I feel like they're not cheating you. They're, you know, they're stating whatever price it is they think they need, uh, but their work seems to be pretty good, which is hard to find. But they, you do have to wait a little bit sometimes. And, um, oh, so we're talking back on the AC yeah. that people are talking about chewing up uh, ACs and stuff. Well, they got into the one of ours, and there was, was a very mouse. dried out mouse that was like this. It was, it had chewed on the main line to the capacitor, blown up the capacitor. You know, they're, they're fairly good size. The capacitor was all blown out. So uh, it had a very uh, cartoonish look and... Um, a very quick think, and not very painful death, I'm guessing. I think it got electrocuted. It got a heck of a charge, yeah. uh, but that shut down. I didn't open it up. In fact, if I would have seen that, I probably could have fixed that. But yeah. um, just ordered the capacitor. But he did a regular service, which we hadn't done in a few years. Yeah. And so, and then he did a light service on the other one and got him and put some juice in him and one of them, and so got everything up and going. So yeah, but we uh, we also seem to have had a mouse problem along with other people. Yep. White Picket Fence, hello. Thanks for watching the garden video. Yeah, I was actually surprised. I posted the garden video at 8 o'clock this morning. Now, I didn't um, I didn't share it anywhere for a number of hours just because I was curious at what YouTube was doing. But there was only like 20 views within four hours on that video. It's just, I, I think since we haven't been posting as much recently, it's not promoting us as much even though we have a you know with the almost 3200 subscribers as you think it would have shown up here or there but um well, well people I, are busy on the weekends so. no there is that too i mean it was eight o'clock this a morning a lot of people but, will be watching them oh about 10 30 on monday at work probably at work <laughs> um, no but i i used to get more views at the very beginning like it was pushing it and you know if people have the bell checked off on YouTube. It's supposed to send them a notification that it came up. So, oh, well, um, once I got it promoted to like Facebook and stuff, it started picking things up. Yep. You got it notified as soon as it put it up. Okay. So at least then it's still doing something, but, um, but whatever, I still promote it too. But uh, anyway, so we have a raspberry heart at harvest. We also were out there looking at what was growing in our backyard as far as chicken forage while we're taking care of things. One thing we noticed is our chicken forage grows right under our walnut tree. Yeah, it's never had a problem. Sometimes it gets a little shaded out, but if we give it a start before all the leaves come out, there isn't really an issue. No, and walnuts, if you don't know, actually produce in their roots a chemical called jugalone, I want to say. Um, it 
basically prevents a lot of plants from growing right under it, but our forage are basically our, um, especially the, uh, the grains are doing fine. Like there's barley and there's oats growing under there without a problem. Uh, we do also have some brassicas and some turnips and stuff in our forage blend, and those weren't growing too close, but kind of interesting little experiment, what grows under a walnut tree. Um, but we have lots of oats there around the area as well. So there's a picture of our oats growing for our chickens, waiting for the meat Just chickens to Just a little bit them. of oats. Mostly we have barley and yeah, a little bit of buckwheat. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So sometimes we get we we introduce some um, sunflower seeds, and sometimes we get some broom corns or other things that are usually part of feed scratch yeah. blends that end up growing. Yep. Um, and we did take a walk around back as well to see. Well, took put in for a walk, but we got a couple of pictures of things. One mushroom that was not to eat, by the way. Middle of the path today. I. Yeah. <laughs> said, look what showed Looks, up, and it wasn't there a day or so ago. Look what's growing. In the, yeah, no, it wasn't there a day ago because I was walking pudding. But look what's growing in the middle of the path. This one, do not eat <laughs> unless you want to be trippy. Um, but yeah, that, that one's, one, that's an one, amanita. One, yeah, so one form of either poisonous yeah. or at least toxic. Yeah. Uh, some of those will cause psychedelic effects, which yeah. is obviously a toxicity and a medical condition in itself, whether it's taken purposefully or accidentally, it's <laughs> definitely causing a toxic medical condition. Oh. But some of them are, are pretty bad. So. Yeah. So that one, yeah, some of them cause some, yeah, uh, hallucin hallucinogenic. As I said earlier, what did I say earlier? Hallucinogenic <laughs> or something um, effects on people. But this one is... It? Most amanitas will not kill you, but some of them will make you wish you wanted to die yeah, before no, you got done it. with them all. Yeah, so, <laughs> so don't eat amanitas, but I, it was a pretty mushroom in yeah. the path. Um, they are definitely pretty. Uh, but we did also, this just started blooming in our back area. This is, actually, I should ask you guys, who knows what this flower is? Um, it's a common medicinal. Yes. It's not typically used as an edible, as more as a medicinal. Um, dried and used to treat depression, actually. Um, so usually made into a tea. And it's... Just the flowers or the whole thing? Um, you know, I haven't needed to use it. So I think Nabi does the whole thing, the petals and leaves, um, not the stems. Part, no but way. yeah. But it dries them and uses uses them. So any guesses? Any guesses? Um, we didn't have much of this at all last year. Only had a couple little spots with it, but it's definitely coming out. Definitely in the area. Some of our neighbor neighboring areas have a yeah. decent amount coming out a lot more. We're having a lot more of the wildflowers out. I think with all the uh, we had a bad wildflower but, year last year. Yeah, uh, just weather change. Yeah. You know fluctuations that we get year to year it was it was not a good year and this year it seems like it's a good year yep got yes, it. yes to live is to suffer hello yes you got it and tina got it st john's work um yep so that is starting so are you, to come out are you capturing and google searching it google picture searching or <laughs> you actually know <laughs> well but uh, there's a delay so yep. i do have to give them that yep um yep so yeah <laughs> bruce says she doesn't even have a guess um well now you know Yep, St. John's wort. It's uh, often used to treat depression, uh, which is kind of interesting. But there is another one that's used in a tea, but usually more for flavoring. So I'll pull that one up. Anybody know what this one is? Besides the bee that's pollinating it, there are probably a couple common names for this one. Um, yeah, St. Uh, White Pick Fence Hat got the last one as People well. People are pretty good with that one. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a bit of a delay tonight, so I'll give it a moment. But this one, I love the flowers. You can buy this one in different colors for your garden. Uh, but this is the one we have growing wild out and back. And I have quite a bit of it right now. Yeah, I was thinking about maybe even seeing if I could transplant some into part of the garden, see if I could get it to come back next year. Uh, yes. It will come back where it's at. <laughs> it will come back where it's at and back. And we have it all yeah. over the fields. Um, 
Yeah, Tina, you don't want to, you don't. <laughs> really? Oh, boy. Um, you don't want to mix the St. John's wort with your meds. If, uh, they can, you do always have to ask before doing that. But um, Brie, you're right. Bee balm. And another name for it, anybody. Um, there is a second name for it. Let's see. I actually got the seeds from MI Gardener last year in okay. a grab bag. Cool. Yeah, and I got some from, I don't think they started, but I think we turned the soil uh, with a broad fork of the soil where I put them. Um, I actually got some seeds from our permaculture instructor as well, locally, uh, for a darker red one. Hmm. But we could probably get that again. That's not, not hard. But uh, So that's bee balm, also wild bergamot. It's not actually the same bergamot as the citrus bergamot. Yeah, but the bergamot and tea and Russian tea or in English, like um, tea is, is, is in the citrus family. It is in the citrus family. But little known fact in early America was that when they were protesting the tea from England, a lot of people still wanted their Earl Grey tea, which is the bergamot flavoring. And a lot of people thought this plant tasted a little like bergamot. I think it tastes more like oregano. But... Oh, the same people who thought chicory tasted like coffee. Clearly had a taste bud <laughs> issue. Well, you could still drink it. Yeah. Uh, and the bergamot <laughs> tastes fine. I, mean, I, I like Earl Grey, not constantly, yeah. but in doses. Uh, I don't mind the bergamot, but bergamot can really be overpowering. I don't mind this. I don't mind the bee balm. Uh, and it's similar, but yeah, it's kind of oregano-y. Yeah. And um, so those are the main new flowers. Actually, it'd probably be good to stick it in a roast chicken. It might stick be. a couple pats of butter and, and that would be a fun video. Experiment. We could go pull. Pull herbs from the wild. Yeah, and do, because there's so many things that you yeah. could do a roasted chicken that would. You can also are generally probably, tasty. I wonder if you could, because um, I've only eaten it fresh, but some of the sorrels. The yeah, lemony the lemon. flavors. Um, you could probably use that as well. Some things break down with heat. I don't. Yeah, think I don't that know. Does. So um, I know the bear one would be, or the um, bee balm would be <laughs> fine. Yep, yep. So okay, well that was kind of my list of pictures for the day, but um, <laughs> pudding shifted again. I, apparently she's warm because now her head is on the tile behind. Well, me. she had. A reasonable amount of gas and then got up and moved. <laughs> There's that too. Um, she doesn't do as much as many dogs as we've had. But... St. Bernard was bad. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, she doesn't stink like other dogs do. Either. No. <laughs> she doesn't eat nearly as much. No, I would doesn't. say I was cleaning up the yard. I clean up half as much from her as I cleaned up from either of the other boys. Yes. We had. We had so. a previous Great Dane and a previous St. Bernard. And they both went to the bathroom like three oh. times a day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I invented a new dish and call it Weedy Chicken. Yeah. Yeah. Might have to do a couple different types. I don't know if the uh, bee balm chicken would go well or the bee balm would go well with the sorrel. Sure. I think the sorrel, the lemon flavor, a lemon it. herb chicken is super common. That's I don't true. see any problem yeah. doing that at all. Yeah, having an oregano y thyme, you know, earthy flavors. Um, might find we have so a little bit of sage growing in the garden, a little bit of lavender, yeah. and some things that are planted, but yeah. not necessarily wild. But I think we could find a, you know, a few we things. A few things, yeah. Depends wild on the things. time of year to. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, do like that that one in tea. Uh, we also have something that came back this year. Um, what was it? Poison ivy? No. Another lemony thing. Lemon balm. Oh, yeah. Duh. Uh, so we have that in the garden this year. We didn't plant, but it came back. Um, yeah. <laughs> we don't get, well, we get some bug activity with the dog poop, but not not big dung beetles or anything. No. No. Too, too cold here for that. No, <laughs> flies. We get flies. The flies like the chickens as well, but mm, that's another matter. Anyway, should we get off of the that end of things and move into actual food end of things? Um, I don't have. I should have taken a picture of dinner tonight. Well, the turkey tonight was local. 
Yeah, it, it got. I threw, so it was only it was only half frozen or less than half thawed, I guess. Uh, it was from our neighbor, our neighbor's small farm, and mm -hmm. we've had it sitting in the freezer for a while. Well, I pulled it out a couple of days ago, but it thawed out very slow, and I didn't get a chance to brine it, so I just threw it on the smoker. But when you put chilled turkey on, it doesn't really glisten. It looks more like dusty black sooty uh, skin even though oh. it was smoked so yeah. yeah it wasn't it tastes fine but picture wise it was not it, was useful. Not, it wouldn't have been it wasn't really sure. oiled up and but we did have some local... slow smoke to actually let thaw while yeah. smoking and then got cooked all the way yeah so we did actually have a local turkey for dinner tonight um not on thanksgiving although we'll probably have to ask her for another for thanksgiving uh, see if we could get one we need to get some freezer room. One of the easy ways to get some freezer room is to eat the stuff that's in Remove there. something large like a turkey that could go into multiple things. I put yep. some of it back in there, but. Um, so have a city inspection tomorrow. So, what I call food, he calls weeds, unless they're in dedicated beds. Really? Whatever happened to biointensive gardening in the French? Yeah, intensive where, do, method? where do you live? What? I forget. Yeah. There was a somebody in Florida location? who just, the state of Florida just made a yeah. governor signed a bill that you are allowed to grow vegetables in your front and yard. edibles in your front yard, regardless of city ordinance. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure if a private HOA gated community has jurisdiction over that, but as far as a city or a county can no longer tell you, you can't grow any form of um, food, food driven items in your front yard. So that was a big... That was a big change. <laughs> Case it's a foggy brain caused by pregnancy. Yes, blank out on it. It happens sometimes anyway, but yeah. Yeah, we don't I'll get any city inspection. I've never been anywhere that really had a city inspection. As long as no. your as long as your grass was cut or you know that if it showed that it was groomed and managed, they yeah. didn't they didn't care. Um, here we're rural enough that I mean, there's people that still have undeveloped land where the county comes by and cuts twice a year mows yeah. uh, you know mows off the road so they like, they have it, yeah. yeah so they have uh, wild right up to that um and, and we we cut our front 30 feet and then we have some everything else is managed yeah i don't know lost the elderberry bush before it's told bush has to be in a bed that that's crazy that's nuts that's nuts and bushes Missouri. make their own beds yeah, <laughs> you can make a hedge out of a Put bush. Put pine straw down over the whole yard and tell them it's a bed. <laughs> there you go. One big bed. Yes, just just do like a whole big back to eat in. Yeah, and with an chip. elderberry, that's crazy. That's a cultivated item. And it's usually uh, for a lot of and times. And it's ornamental. It's ornamental. Ours, are, ours are just finished blooming. Yeah. yeah, yep. Yeah, that's crazy. We just put more, and I have to, I do have Missouri, to do a summary. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I do have to do a summary video on what's going on up front. It's been really slow up front. It hasn't been very fast moving, but I could give a little tour video of what we do have in the ground up front. The, um, the city does an inside and outside for the licensing to rent. That's actually aggressive. That's in one way that's nice for a rental because every time I've been a lot of college towns that where there's rental houses that are just it's run down disasters. They don't do anything because it's students that are in for six months or a year. And so as long as it's not a full on fire trap or whatever, they don't really do much of any inspection. Mm -hmm. You might need to prove that your fire alarm, you know, smoke detectors work. But uh, even in New York area, they don't do, I guess they do building inspections. But I don't know if they do, I don't think they do individual unit inspections. So yeah, that's, that's one way that's good for the renters. Checking my city for alleged new chicken rolls. Only finding the removal of chickens from the ordinance. From, okay. Yeah. Um, our yeah. so Kalamazoo, which is our close bigger city, they allow six um, hens. hens yeah. No roosters yeah. uh, for a residential property, and I think you may need to inform them. Yeah. And have it on record or have a permit, but you just get it. They don't. Portage just south also has a limit to hens and might be limited to the number of them i forget but they have to be permitted to have them in the backyard but they do give those permits um so i do have some friends who live in portage with chickens as well 
But yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They pass a lot that should not be passed. Yeah, I'm not surprised. But yep. at least, I mean, it's, it's at least a basic inspection is, is better than most towns will do. So if something's really yeah. egregious, at least they, uh, you yeah. know, the big but thing sometimes is. sometimes they have silly rules, though. The big thing, so like when we were in, in around the New York area, was they were concerned if they saw a lot of water or electric use that too many people were being housed. Yeah. Like, you know, lab, labor, cheap labor that was being paid for, you know, multiple people to rooms or whatever and they were concerned about that because it wasn't zoned to be dormitories and you know and houses and of course it's not it's not safe you have fires and other things so that they were on top of um but otherwise i don't think they did anything not much but um should we get back to the food i yeah. think uh we'll do the um ask the chef section which tina did post one question to the facebook page already she was asking about making ketchup with um, with peppers, with sweet peppers, and then one with hot peppers. Mm -hmm. And um, if you knew of any good ketchup recipes and how yeah. to come about that. So ketchup's a pretty wide open category. I think it's hard to define ketchup. Basically, it's got a sour component to it. Usually vinegar is introduced, mm -hmm. uh, although sometimes it could be sour vegetables or citrus. Um, but I think that's about vinegar and spices and, and that's and, and some form of vegetable or fruit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's about as close as you get now. So going back. So the, the most popular, of course, is tomato ketchup. Um, and then going back to the origins of ketchup, I was saying a lot of it was from India. It's actually back to China uh, and possibly Malaysia, but Chinese, Chinese in origin. Um, and it's basically vinegar and spices, but sometimes had a lot of fermented um, fish or other things. So the earliest things that were called ketchup or a variant of it were effectively something similar to what we would call fish sauce mm -hmm. uh, today. And then they may have some brown spices and heavier spices added to them or other vegetables were then added to them. Um, the Romans had something called gar that they loved and they seasoned everything with gar and, and used it as a condiment. It was basically a sun-dried or fermented or pickled fish that was, you know, a, a rotten fish sauce that they heavily salted uh, sea great. salt, which would be not very different from what this original ketchup yeah. was. And the Romans, there's records of the Romans putting it on everything. But that's, again, not different from going into East Asia and having all the different fish sauces and shrimp paste and heavily salt fermented seafood items. So um, that's actually the origin. But then ketchup really came to, um, you know, to the West and eventually started to add more things like fruits and vegetables. And so to say ketchup does not require that it be tomato. We'll go back to making tomato ketchup. I just pulled something I've had for years from the Henry Ford birthplace, the restaurant, uh, the, what is it called? The 616, whatever, the, the, their historic restaurant. They had some menu cards that I bought years and years ago. Um, and I don't think it has it on there. It's no. taste. Taste of History rep uh, Recipe Collection. Fall from Harvest Henry Ford 1998. Museum. Yeah, Fall Harvest 98. Uh, Henry Ford Museum in Greenfield. That was Village. like our first year dating. Probably. We were uh, with your not dad. even. We didn't date until 99. Yeah. Oh, just... these were bought. These were bought last year's collection. <laughs> so it was 99 when I got them. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Um, so in this were a bunch of historic recipes that could be interesting, yeah. but. And this was their fall recipes. Um, so they have a lemon ketchup, which uses lemon and, and powdered cloves and horseradish and mace and nutmeg and black pepper and mustard seed, all in salt. Those are all things that are common in a lot of ketchups. They have a grape ketchup that uses a purple, like Concord or Delaware grape, brown sugar, pepper, cloves, cinnamon, allspice, vinegar, salt, and mace. Uh, same thing, sweet and sour. They have a cucumber ketchup, uh, chopped cucumbers. A taste of history restaurant. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Okay. It's the one, um, Taste of History Restaurant is the one that's the cafe, I want to say, in yeah. the in the museum, not in the village. Oh, I think they were... The one in the village is uh, Eagle Tavern. They were selling these at Eagle Tavern because okay. we had eaten lunch there. Yeah. And yeah. I, put, I picked them up there. Yeah. Um, so anyways, they have a, cu a cucumber ketchup that has mustard seed, 
cayenne, horseradish, cider vinegar, and such. So if you think about historical recipes, they didn't always have a lot of hot peppers in colonial America. That wasn't, wasn't they weren't there. I don't think they were so desirable if you're coming from a lot of European immigrants. So they would use for spicing things up a lot of vinegar and a lot of things like horseradish and mustard powder, mustard seed. So that's some alternative. So you can basically take, I mean, all kinds of things, uh, apricots or plums or, or you know, green tomatoes, red tomatoes, whatever, and you can um, you can start making ketchups. You can also use dried products. So tomato ketchup became the most popular, which everybody puts on everything. Yeah, mushroom ketchup. I noticed that uh, I saw a recipe for mushroom ketchup too. Um, so same thing, some vinegar based condiment. Um, I think a lot of times it's close to what we would call a a chutney or a relish um, because of the vinegar and spice components. Although most of our ketchups are pureed, um, yeah. smooth and and cooked down. Um, so the tomato ketchups. Uh, became popular and so they have first of all the, the first component in modern tomato ketchup is sugar so if you ever try and make any of these things you want it's going to be like two or three parts sugar to one part fruit mm -hmm. and if you think about jam it's two parts sugar one part fruit is your classic jam jelly recipe so you're up in that territory so don't confuse yourself if it's not tasting right you can make lower sugar but you're going to need a lot of sugar. And that can come from cane sugar, brown sugar, molasses. You could add some honey or maple. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of ways to get the sugar in. You get a lot of the texture, the viscosity, uh, the preservation uh, qualities from, from the sweetener, too. Um, so, yeah, that's... Um, you can even use palm sugar and other things. Yeah. But um, lots of sugar, a decent amount of fruit. Uh, almost always has a vinegar component that could come from, or it could have other souring things. I believe Heinz ketchup and a number of ketchups have tamarind in them. So the tamarind seed or pod and the, and the fruit uh, around it is very sour. It has a really nice earthy flavor and it's a good blending item. So there's some really good barbecue sauces that are based mm -hmm. off of tamarind. Uh, a lot of Asian barbecue sauces or so-called barbecue sauces are tamarind, but, um, yeah, so there's tamarind, I believe, in Heinz, and I think uh, Open Pit Barbecue which is sauce, which is kind of a weird, honestly, recipe and flavor-wise. It's a really weird sauce. It was it, it was the preferred sauce in, I guess, the 80s, but it's kind of changed formats to a much sweeter, smokier-style barbecue for commercial barbecue. But that has a lot of tamarind, and that lends to some of the interesting flavors. So beyond that, brown spices, and brown spices we're talking about clove maybe a little bit of nutmeg or mace allspice is very prevalent um possibly cinnamon or star anise and so now you're driving the spice route the spice trade from india asia caribbean mm -hmm. and so that they're good flavors and they're good blending items uh, they bring everything together uh, but they're also traditionally used in preservation uh, and they create rich you know rich deep flavors and balance um so that's your, your common, and you don't need a lot of those because they're pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. So if I was going to make a homemade look-alike ketchup, which I've done a number of times. We used to do a red wine ketchup, by the way, which is really good. Reduced down a ton of red wine, like <laughs> bottles of cheaper red wine. And then this we, is for work. This is for a restaurant, yeah. yes, for fine dining and yeah. for some you know, specialty burgers, foie gras sliders, things oh, like that. Oh, my gosh. So we'd blend, you know, like chopped sirloin and foie gras together or stuff it and then you do you know, like a cabernet ketchup or something or a merlot ketchup and we'd add some regular ketchup and then we would dress it up with other spices and things mm -hmm. that we'd blend in you can build a barbecue sauce the same way so i would start out with a bunch of really ripe super ripe sweet tomatoes or probably canned tomatoes if you don't have premium super sweet tomatoes uh, a good amount of probably brown sugar white sugar or cider vinegar because I like the fruitiness but you can use white wine vinegar I would have a I'd like a little tamarind in there uh, definitely some salt uh, for balance and I would probably add a decent amount of allspice and a little bit of black pepper and then I'd kind of hang tight and let it cook down might like a little you know a little mace in there mace has a brightness to it and yeah and then I would just kind of hang on that 
uh, you can introduce hot spices or you know hot peppers or cayenne or you know again some red wine or something like that but um i would cook it down and you have to be careful because it's so sweet and all the vegetable pulp that you don't burn it and after it feels like everything has sort of come together flavor wise and it's softened enough uh, i would either mill it through a fine mill uh, um, if you want just a little bit of texture or i would gently puree it cuisinart is a little harder than a blender but I would just gently, on a fairly low setting, make sure it's fully pureed. Um, if you have any concern, oh, and make sure if you have whole spices, uh, put them in a sachet and pull them out before you blend it. Uh, so, uh, but you know, you could put a piece of cinnamon stick in there or one star anise or things. Those those you'd want out. Before and, blending. Yeah, you blend it. And then um, you, if you blend it, you still may want to put it through a sieve, um, you know, a strainer. Uh, just with the back of a spoon or a ladle in case there's any chunks. And then I might, I would look at how thick it is. Like plum, I've done a lot of plum ketchups and barbecue sauces and fruit sauces. And then I might put it back on the heat if it's too wet. I'll just put it back on the heat and let it simmer. But at this point, you really got to watch the burning and sticking uh, and try and bring it down thick enough. Um, you can always add fruit pectin. You're going to have a bunch in there, but if you want to thicken it, um, and another thing you can do when you're making these ketchups, they might be Hi, Swampy thinner Acres. when they're hot. So you may want to put a little spoonful streaked across a plate. What we do is take a frozen plate or we'll take a plate and throw it in a refrigerator or a freezer for a couple minutes and we just let it cool down. And that's a good way to tell when you're making a cold sauce, how is it going to handle, how is it going to set uh, mm -hmm. before you take it off the heat if you need to do more reduction. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you want to make sure that it's going to be the right consistency. Um, a lot of the sauces will tend to break and weep. In fact, ketchup does it, but it's very controlled how much liquid comes out. So if you have a really cheap ketchup, not one of your name brands, you may see a lot more water coming That's out true. of it because yeah. they haven't controlled that separation and, and Didn't flow. Didn't Heinz have a, um, a claim on the name ketchup rather than catsup? Well, they spell oh. it differently, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it was... Cats up for K versus else. C. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well, it's not and, even that. And the, uh, it's the CH in there in yeah, the middle of it. Yeah. Um, so there's a variety of ways to spell it. But yeah, you've yeah. got a lot of flexibility, but it's a great way to use fruit that's not perfect, like for jams and jellies. It's also a great way to use fruit that's underripe. So if you have the sour component, you can. Um, you can accentuate that. And if you don't have enough sweetness, you're adding in all that sweetness with with sugar product, and um, and so you can make that adjustment if you have some good fruit flavors. I was saying hi to ASL, by the way. I figured that out. Yeah. <laughs> so you can also, um, yeah, so you can work with anything. And so a pepper jelly, I do the same type of things. You can, Oh, the other thing we didn't talk about, you can put some onion product in there, mm. whether it be granulated onion or you're cooking down some fresh onion in there as part of it. Uh, I wouldn't brown most of the items. I just, I just let them cook in there. Mm. Um, but yeah, you can do all kinds of um, pepper jellies, jam, you know, similar ketchup type. What things. if you did? Could you do like a straight pepper ketchup without? You could. Um, I, you know, I'd be careful with the heat on it, or you know, you could blend other things into it. What if you mix sweet and hot, maybe. Yeah, you could do that. Sometimes they get bitter, so you okay. may consider blending in something simple, like a, some type of fruit. Yeah. Tomatoes, peaches, you know, apricots. I don't know, something to give it some body and some more texture. Because a lot of your peppers are thin, thin skinned, and they don't have a lot of structure. You know, once yeah. you cook them down, they're. Okay. Uh, so I might consider adding something that's got a good amount of pulp to it. Um, but you can also, I mean, you can use, you can use juices and other things. And if you need to add a thickener, you could add a. There's something we have to try this fall. We have to see if we can make it with the autumn olives. Yeah. Because that's supposed to taste like a tomato ketchup um, because of the same. And again, my brain's not working. The pro the same thing that makes it red in ketchup. Oh, the, the lycopene? Yes. It's in you can also olives. see the walnut pickles and watermelon cake. Oh, yeah. I'm the sure book. there's probably a dozen recipes for ketchups in there. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious what other fruit items. Do you want me to um, grab that or no? Yeah, you can. Okay. And so other things that historically even nuts were made into ketchup, like walnuts. Um, 
and we did talk about mushrooms. So so this a, is the book that he's talking about. This which, is really hard to find. Yeah. It's a very limited release. We actually and suggested it's way it out of print. to it's, Curie. We suggested this book to um, to uh, Recipe Archaeology, uh, and I got a response from them. And uh, they said thanks for that recommendation because there's a lot of crazy recipes in here. But uh, Yeah, and if you find that your homemade ketchup isn't up, it's going to taste a little different. Yeah. Probably you can get it close to Heinz, but that's actually very hard to do the mimic. Um, but if you find it's not as pleasant as you'd like it and it's a little off balance, blend a bunch of commercial ketchup in, cut it 50-50, and it should balance itself out. Yeah. Sort of like barbecue sauce base. Base for a lot of barbecue sauces can involve a lot of ketchup on, on the, your red ones. Ketchup. Cherry, cucumber, currant, gooseberry, grape, lemon, mushroom, red pepper, tomato, and walnut ketchups. Yep. All recipes. I'm here. wondering if some of those recipes are the same as these cards because they both, they this was published at Wayne State University. Oh, yeah. Which is, and some professors, they, it mostly was recipes from this side of the state, but I believe they're professors at Wayne State, which is in Detroit. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And of course, the Henry Ford Museum. Henry Ford is in Detroit. So there yeah. may have been, some, I'm sure there's some strong carryover if they're doing a historical recipe gathering. Yeah. Um, yeah. Green cucumbers. Peel, let them lie in salt water for a short time. Uh, <laughs> cherry ketchup's easy. Pint of cherry juice, half a pound of sugar, a, tea, a teaspoonful ground cloves. of ground cloves, which is and a lot cinnamon. of cloves, and cinnamon. Boil until it thickens into a syrup and stick it in a bottle. <laughs> so, so they're starting yeah. with juice so they don't have to puree it later. One, two, three, four. Four parts to that recipe, four components. Yep. And because cherries tart, they're not even adding a vinegar component. Cucumber ketchup. They have two of them. Uh, Medium-sized cucumbers. Great. Press the juice. Add vinegar to a consistency of ketchup. Season with salt and pepper. Taste and seal. So that they're not even cooking. That's Kalamazoo, 1899. Yeah. That's really just a, a vinegar <laughs> relish sauce. It's like making a hot pepper yeah. Uh, and preventing it from further um, souring. There's a second cucumber. That one's from Kalamazoo. They have one from Detroit from, yeah, a little bit earlier. They period. have a chili sauce. By the way, making chili sauce is a lot of styles. Your parents, your sauce. family makes a not very hot chili sauce. That is a form of pretty much a yeah. ketchup. Yeah. A spiced ketchup. Yeah, my I think someone in my family didn't like it spicy, but they liked the sauce without it. Well, I think they probably made it without it all along. They could have made it without the chilies, but why would they call it chili sauce if they didn't? Well, have if you sauce? buy if you buy Heinz chili sauce for making cocktail sauce, okay, in the cans, it's made with I think it's got tomato. Product. It's definitely got chilies in it, but it's not extremely spicy at all. When you make your cocktail sauce spicy, yeah. you're well, adding in no Tabasco chilies. and other things. They have no chilies in their chilli sauce. I guess it makes it hard to be chilli sauce. Though. Yeah, <laughs> so I think someone dropped the chilies because they didn't like the heat. And that one's a very spice. It's a little bit sweet and very. Okay. Like What's you should the book probably get name? that recipe from your mother. I, I do need to get a number of them because they're all actually uh, family friends recipes. Um, walnut pickles and watermelon cake. So this a was... Century of Michigan Cooking uh, by Larry B. Macy and Priscilla Macy. So they're professors. They extracted recipes from primarily newspapers and I think some church cookbooks and other things. Most of them being on the west side of the state. Uh, this was published in the 1990, what, 1991, I think we got. Um, yeah. But the recipes are pre-1920, I think. And um, so, yeah. Published in 1990. Uh, but it was done on Wayne State Press, so yeah. it was a very limited. I got this used. It was very hard to find it used. And I think I paid $100 or $130 for it. For I, this book, yeah. I really wanted it, and it was in good shape. And I, I paid a lot for a used book. Tomato mustard. There's a tomato mustard. Yeah. And walnut ketchup. Uh, fresh green shells from 200 walnuts. When they're ripe enough to shell, lay them in a deep pan, sprinkling each layer with salt. Let them stand a week. <laughs> strain them each day with a wooden spoon. Then strain through a sieve and measure the liquid into a saucepan. And to each pint of liquor, add a quarter ounce of brute. Uh, bruised ginger, 
quarter ounce of mace and a small piece of garlic and then boil that together for 20 minutes and then set to cool and bottle it. Hmm. So they actually let their walnuts... I think ginger, either dry ginger, which is a very different flavor than fresh ginger, and the ginger peel has a different flavor than an old ginger versus new ginger. But I think ginger is a good item to include small amounts if you're making a homemade ketchup. So you can do things that are a little bit more adulty by you know, adding very small amounts of the ginger, yeah. very small amounts of some of these spices. And you know, I like the red wine reduction for the souring and some of the sweetening. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, if, if it ups the cost, but doing a Merlot or a Cabernet or red wine, you know, and you reduce that down all the way to a syrup and add it into your ketchup and then continue to cook it down, that's pretty dressed up if you want to really have an upscale barbecue item. Gooseberry uh, ketchup has a lot of currants in it, too. Huh. That would be pretty good because they're really sour. Yeah. I think it would make a nice ketchup. Yeah. So um, that might be more based off of some European things. Europe, they don't really do ketchup uh, much. Um, they like the mayonnaise. The, bread, so the breads do. You have HP ketchup. Yeah. Which is. But they often like. They don't and they use Heinz. Ketchup on the fries as much. They like the mayonnaise on the fries. Yeah. Um, which someone mentioned earlier that they can't stand mayonnaise on the fries. I don't mind it. I did my study abroad in the Netherlands and they have a garlic mayonnaise that was really good to dip fries into. So I got addicted to that and missed that a little bit. Chili sauce and the grape jelly of meatballs. I was trying to explain that to people on the East Coast actually to make some for <laughs> one of the chefs because they'd never seen it. I said, oh, that's at every potluck in the Midwest. And I'm like, he's, he's like, that sounds terrible. I said, it does sound terrible. And in the end, it not my favorite, but it doesn't yeah. taste that bad. Uh, so uh, now what I think European chefs might have done something similar, but they would have used currant jelly because mm. they use currant jelly in everything as a sweetener. And we didn't really have yeah. a lot of currant jelly in modern, say, 1950s, 60s houses. So people started using grape jelly. So chili sauce. And if you think about some of the old British cold sauces that would be served with cold meats, uh, have a lot of horseradish, have a lot of sour fruit components, sometimes some some chili hot, you know, some spiciness. Um, and you'll find those cold sauces, which are not as developed and used today. You'll find them in your old cookbooks, and especially your British ones. Um, so, yeah. Did you find that book on Amazon? Yeah. That, I know. Uh, I, could, I, saw I, that. I had to get it through a specialty source. Um, I don't know if it shows up on Amazon, but you never know. If they found it... Just says I'm so tempted to get it, but get a short vacation in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, they have a lot of crazy things in here. They do have the succotash. They do have baked chestnuts and some regular things. Do they have um, chow chow? That's more East Coast, though. I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm just skimming through it. But it's a lot of course, of Michigan, stuff. everybody immigrated from somewhere. Because it's not, from it's the, not the old, you know, it's not the oldest state. It's an old state. But Around here, a lot of things are named after things in New York. Yeah, so. People landed yeah. somewhere else, yeah. you know, right? yeah. <laughs> for the most part, before they ended up here. Yeah. Um, asparagus loaf. Ugh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> uh, yeah. Scalloped beans. Uh -huh. Yeah. They have a lot of interesting things. Well, if you think about grape jelly, it's not only that a sweetener can be used as a sugar replacer. Uh, grapes have glucose in them, uh, unlike most uh, fruit, fruit is fructose. So, by the way, that makes it the worst for people that are diabetic because it, it's straight glucose. And that's probably why dogs and things aren't supposed to have, have them. Um, but you can use it as a wine replacer for a lot of people that didn't have access to wine or cost or religiously were not uh, drinking a fermented product. Of course... While you can use a fruit juice, an apple juice, or a grape juice in place of wine, it never really fully replaces. You get some of the sourness and some of the sweetness, but it isn't the same as a fermented uh, cooked item. Uh, one thing that's used a lot in France and parts of Europe is verjou. Verjou is the green, uh, you know, it means green juice. So it's the it's the green juice pressed, um, and it's bottled, either cooked or bottled, and they stop the ferment. So it has um, usually no or very, very little alcohol or ferment in it. It's basically green grape juice. And that was used in a lot of sauces as a souring component, mm. whereas wine has that vented component. And finding verjou around 
in the United States, even in big cities, is very hard. It's imported, and you pay. We used to buy some. We did a chicken with a verju finished sauce. It was really nice at one place. We paid a ton for it, and it should be cheap. It should be dirt cheap because you, you know, you haven't done anything but press the juice. And it's just a different than our, our drinking grape juice, but it's a great cooking component. Mm. Uh, and it's really hard to actually, it's hard to replace it when a old French recipe calls for verju. I'd use a very light white wine or limit the white wine or put a little, but it, you don't get exactly the same effect. Pumpkin butter. As made in the North Woods. That could either mean the UP or North and Lower Pumpkin, Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I got one for you. So... Uh, and tomato oatmeal butter. spinach soup. Well, oatmeal is a great thickener because of all the um, all the fiber in it, um, and it's and it's healthful. So um, I could see that, and it would be low cost, and it would yeah. be something that people always have around. Uh, hey, and it's gluten free <laughs> for all those who <laughs> who are on it on such a kick. Um, it'd be almost like doing a green so. I was going through, this is ridiculous. I should have taken a picture or a video. I was going through our local big box store, and there was a kiosk and demonstration selling a chef uh, professional level uh, blender, which I'm quite fond of. And they had some moron trying to sell it with his little microphone thing. Um. And he's got a blender, and he's... I didn't catch all the ingredients because I was walking by. He had half an onion with the skin peel on. He had a whole carrot with the top, skin, everything else. Big handful of spinach and some form of an avocado. I think it was half an avocado, definitely with the skin on. I'm not sure if the pit was in it or it was a whole of avocado. Had some other spices and whatever else. And all I heard him saying is, you just throw it all in there. You don't need to chop anything up. We've cut all those. Sleeping. <laughs> She's sparking in her sleep. <laughs> and uh, they said, so there's no need for a cutting board. There's no need to chop it and save all your time. Throws it all in the blender. He says, and you use hot water, not cold water. And you blend it for like six minutes and you get a puree soup. And of course, um, high-powered blenders will create enough friction that they will actually bring a soup up to temperature. Uh, cooked you know, temperatures. I've seen that commercially. With it's, There's some interesting puree soups to do that. So he's pureeing it like crazy, and I'm going on my own business. And I'm just looking at, like, the, who taught this person to cook? Or whatever they're calling it they're doing. Onion skins and carrot tops and uh, avocado I, I'm all for using as much of the product as reasonable. I'm also all for using peels and outer surfaces, which can be highly nutritious when reasonable and puree soups aren't bad but you know the tops of carrots which are edible i don't really care for them but people do use it yeah but the part where it goes from from orange to you know kind of breaking down black brown and then goes to the to the top uh we had something so when in culinary school when we're preparing things you you wash and, and trim things and you have your main product that you're trying to achieve, whatever the dice or round or whatever it is. And then you have edible trim, which would be all of those things that got peeled off to get the shape or thing that you needed, but could go into stocks or soups or, or some use, go into a stuffing, and that's called edible trim. There's something called non-edible trim. That's dirt, it's non, you know, it's non-desirable pieces, it's um, damaged peelings, um, damaged, bruised, and, and rotting areas, and whatever else. That goes into compost. So they got rid of that concept and decided just to puree the whole darn thing and make a soup. I did not stick around to try it. Um, I don't know if any of you have eaten an avocado peel. I haven't. I'm not looking forward to it, even yeah. if it is micro-pureed. Um, so, yeah, considering... Maybe you got a love for cooking from the Bookstone soup. <laughs> I don't know. I'm guessing it was a authorized recipe that was instructed by their corporate staff, uh, but I think they took it a step too far. <laughs> I, I would challenge their their professional cooking, uh, either knowledge or or their um, decision making, and tell them they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. If you want to peel and scrape and cut some basic ends off of things, maybe remove the peel from the avocado. Yeah. Right. Um, 
have a squeeze the innards of the avocado out. Yeah, then then I'm good with making a quick all in one puree. But yeah. smooth smoothie vegetable soup, trash can soup. Yeah. yeah right. You can make stone soup. I'd be happy to add the stone into it while he's um, blending it. Oh, gosh, you could break the machine. I don't know. It's pretty indestructible. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, any other cooking questions? We did the uh, ketchup talk. I didn't see much else come through, but we had a lot of information on ketchup. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else that came through that we may have missed. Um, had, Irish pub made their own cut. Yeah, I would say gastro pubs, uh, places that are doing serious food, but in a relaxed atmosphere or a little more rustic food. Lots of places have taken on making their own ketchup in I'd say the last 10 years. Um, yeah. Some do a pretty good job, make something nice. I always debate on that. Uh, ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise, which you can make from scratch better. Um, the cost due to labor and the ingredients. Basically, they sell, mayonnaise can be sold by the gallon commercially at about the same price as vegetable oil is sold commercially. Mm -hmm which means you have no room for other ingredients and no room for labor um, on it if you're looking at a pure cost option. but um, So I, I am a fan of all of those things in right use, but sometimes you choose to buy a good quality item so you have it on hand, you don't run out, and it's not made poorly so that you can put your time into making other things. But yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of doctoring ketchups for, you know, and on a good gastro pub menu, I think it's a great place to do it. People are starting to make a lot more of their own mustards or doing add-ons with powdered mustard and strong mustards and building in um, other components to make a specialty mustard. Goats, rabbits, and chickens love the carrot tops. Yeah, and people are doing a lot more with the carrot tops. I'm not a big fan. I just think they're awfully grassy and a little strong, but people are putting them into salads. It's that intermediary between the root and the actual green top that uh, I think should go to your... Go to your rabbits Go and goats chickens. and chickens. <laughs> even, even if it's just the smallest amount. How well, do you feel about the celery juice fad? I am thinking about it since a ton is go I have a ton going bad in the fridge. I don't know a lot about that. I can tell you a few things. One, if vegetables are starting to go bad, they're low quality, and I would not juice them because yeah. the flavor or just the general qual properties of it would be diminished. Uh, you might cook them into something. So it's hard. Um, two other things I'd be careful with celery. Celery has a lot of salt in it naturally. We don't think about it, but celery is kind of refreshing because it's salty. Uh, salt, celery also has a pretty high level of natural nitrates in it. Yeah. Nitrates, nitrites. Uh, so. That's what you can use as your alternative and that curing. Can, yeah, and that can be a problem for people with heart conditions or too much of it can is considered to be medically not very good for us. Uh, that's fun in all of our processed and cured. Pink so if you're foods. concentrating it, it's probably not as... Yeah, or if you're just consuming a lot of celery juice for especially a long period of time, I'm not sure what all it would be. Um, it's got no calories, but I, I would just say watch that it's higher in nitrates and it's higher in, in salt. And um, I'm not sure how useful it is, but it might, might work. It's nitrates. Yeah. Celery nitrates. Yeah. yeah. The nitrate nitrates um, break down to nitrites right. under a bacterial or nitrites to nitrates. I always forget. If there's a, you need a bacterial yeah. interaction to cause the chemical conversion to be useful. Nitrates turn into nitrites. Yes, there you that's go. what I thought. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's why you use it to prevent things like botulism and cured meats and stuff. Yeah, because it, it's it will kill my microorganisms at the right consistency. Yeah. And actually, that's the problem. Why, when you get celery powder, they actually inject it with the bacteria that helps do that conversion, mm. and they need to test it that they're actually getting the proper conversion because uh, it can happen in nature. Yeah. And there, because there are areas where the grasses and things have high nitrates, and animals eat it, and then you would and you would cure animals. And smoke animals that turn pink because they had eaten a diet high in nitrates. Mm. Uh, but they realize sometimes it works, sometimes it didn't. You need this bacterial interaction, and so they actually test for that. Um, and the celery powder is used for curing. Yeah. Whole food sells it as a drink. I mean, celery is put into a lot of smoothies. Yeah. Yeah. As a component, but I find that it gets bitter. 
and it's not my favorite flavor so without a bunch of other stuff other fruit or things over the top um yeah but i mean celery is definitely a healthy item and, and reasonable dose so your mom said her grandmother mm. used to make her own ketchup and it was a bit watery yeah a bit mild but not bad yeah um, well again probably the salt and sugar were a little bit low compared to modern day yeah. intensified ketchups uh, and if it was a little watery, a lot of it's just cooking. You just have to keep slowly cooking it. And of course, Heinz and people have all kinds of methods to be very specific about how they develop it. But Hi, yeah. Green Gables. Welcome. Yeah, it's actually 10 after 10, so we got to wrap up here soon. So, celery, but the question so, celery salt is kind of overkill. Well, celery salt is ground celery seed mixed with salt, it's, okay. regular salt. Um, and it's that's not used the as, salt and, in the celery. So you can yeah. buy, yes, yeah, so you can buy celery seed and you can buy celery salt. Um, celery salt typically being used for Bloody Mary. Some people use it for seasoning. I tend not to buy seasonings with salt in it. I figure they're overcharging for salt and I can <laughs> add my own salt inexpensively and to my own needs. If, um, but it's a pulverized celery seed. If somebody was saying, something recently, celery... I think it's high level of celery seed has a chemical that might show up on some drug tests for athletes. Hmm. I was thinking. I'd have to look that one up. Um, something re I mean, we know poppy seeds. Or is it yeah. Athletes try and stay away from poppy seeds, whether they show on tests. I'm not sure, but there's a, a thing that uh, pregnant women should not eat too many poppy seeds just before birth because they test for opioids yeah, in yeah. newborns and they don't you want to You'd have to be eating test. poppy seed rolls all day long. I mean, yeah. every day. I, I, Having a few poppy seeds on something at some point, I'm sure it's not. Yeah, but I think there's something going on with cell or too much celery seeds have a chemical that can, it's toxic. I, I read an article recently. These foods can make you test positive for drugs. Well, that might be in there. Came up in that search. They had poppy seeds listed, whereas, uh, sorry, skimming through it. Um... Yeah, um, and of course they didn't make it an easy list thing. <laughs> Food products that contain these can make you fail a breathalyzer test. Yeah, uh, yeah there would have to be a lot of the yeast. Yeah, no way. That's not, I mean, and having something with some yeast in it is not going to... Because it's fermenting sugars, but you'd have to Come ferment on. a even, lot. Even having a low alcohol yes. kombucha, your your non-controlled kombuchas, no. I don't think blowing a breathalyzer is going to give you anything of, of usefulness. Um, I tried to skim through it. I probably passed it. Anyway, there's something I saw recently yeah. on celery seed. That's what came up when I pulled it up, but yeah. But yeah, that's... um. So celery salt has its place. Um, celery is a very intense um, seasoning. You don't need a lot for it to be able to notice that it's there. And I do think that celery being used in cooking, whether it's in the fresh form or sometimes in the powder, it's a good thing to add very small amounts into your rubs. Um, again, it can overpower really quick, but um, the absence of celery is a loss. Is definitely a loss in flavor. So your classic French um, flavor profile is mirepoix two parts uh, onion, one part carrot, one part celery. And if you take any of one of those two out, the carrots are sweet, a little earthy. The celery is balancing salty, not sweet. And then the onions have that whole bowl. And they, they're a meat replicator, but um, they also cook down with a lot of, a lot of sugar comes out of them. So um, celery has a really good balancing point and savory component. So I think when you're home cooking, don't forget the celery. It's pretty darn expensive. Um, the leaves can be a little bit bitter, so sometimes you leave the leaves out when you're really cooking them down. So, um, looks like a couple people are cutting out. Carrie has to go bottle feed her baby goat in Swampy Acres. It is getting late, so it's 10.15 here, almost. Um, and why big fence going to think about all crazy all bunch of crazy stuff tonight for the rest of the night but yeah uh, well we we only use as the average american uses something like tw eats 12 plants or 12 foods it's something really small is our average total. american diet 
and most of that's yeah. corn, soy, and weed. If you're, or, you know, maybe it's like fifteen, but I think our, our vegetables is like eight or nine. So it's small. iceberg lettuce, romaine lettuce, tomatoes, carrots, onions, some form of onion, garlic, celery, um, and and then you real quick, you know, you you're getting to the outer edges when you're starting to talk about cabbage. We do a little bit, pic, you know, pickles or cucumbers, and but real quick, you're outside of the normal, and then then you just look at all the variety of nuts and herbs and spices and things that grow through the seasons and different green variants. Uh, it's pretty easy to start eating more variety, eating a diverse, more fun, interesting, probably healthier, but just more flavorful yeah. um, through the year. <laughs> And a lot of it has to do with availability. So one thing that's going on right now. Sad. Sad in a couple of ways. Yeah, sad. The standard American diet. diet. <laughs> as, yeah. as they say, compared to the sad diet, any diet is better. Yeah, it's just <laughs> one, of the, one of the people we listen to, he says, the yeah. sad thing is, uh, he's a doc that does some specialty stuff. He goes, the sad diet sad because any other diet basically comes in better. Yeah. Um, but when you look at urban communities and rural communities, uh, well, you're, you're biggest supplier of food in the country is Walmart. Yeah. So if you look around your local Walmart or super Walmart and you look at the produce, that is the standard of what the, and, and they've gotten a lot better on their produce offering. I don't go into Walmart for much often. And I definitely don't buy many groceries, especially uh, fruits and vegetables, but they can be cost effective. They're carrying more commercial, you know, large industrial organic. And for a lot of people, that is the only accessible source the small grocery stores are overly priced, have even less product, and many times it's going bad. So, yeah. um, so they I have get to it. keep moving it. That is the problem. But you, know, you have to keep moving the. The bars. other trend that's happening in the cities and places are uh, WIC and you know, what we used to call food stamps, or basically go different government assistance. WIC and whether Snap and stuff. WIC, Snap, senior uh, programs, um, a lot of convenience stores, gas stations, roadside, you know, what used to be the corner store, liquor store, that sells stuff are all getting EBT more and more and there's a site uh, they're talking about well you only have certain things that are eligible but if you look at the things that are available in your local corner store or gas station even that are ebt eligible like they're not the best choices for full health and the unfortunate thing is you're losing more and more traditional grocery stores in urban areas like our town we have a couple new ones opening but we lost them and that was be, and they're like, look, if you go into the corner store, you're going to the grocery store. Yeah. What's the chances you're going to get something that's going to be more sustaining and healthful? Carrie, when I see people feeding those cheese puffs to the toddlers, it drives me nuts. And the white picket fence, I never feed my kids those cheese curls. Save them for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I got I, a weird one recently. You got a, a vegan one or something. I bought at so it doesn't Costco, have real cheese. It's. What's it called? Uh, they're actually pretty good. Okay. They were super on special. And that's why I grabbed them because um, they're a chickpea based, chickpea and rice flour based puff. It looks like a Cheeto. And this one happens to be vegan, white cheddar flavored. And flavor, texture all around. I mean, they're not. They taste like cheese puffs. The best, best in the world. But yeah. and I'm not. Cheese puff isn't my favorite item. In fact, I haven't had them in years. But oh, um, yeah, they're actually pretty good. I oh my gosh, you're gonna grab them. I don't know. I don't know. These are. He didn't realize they were vegan. I didn't at all when I grabbed. Them. I didn't even know they're cheese puffs. I thought they were chips. Organic chickpea puffs, hiccupies. Hic and they seem to have. Bohemian barbecue, hippies. sriracha, sunshine. No, they're hippies. Oh, that's what it's hippies. Uh, Himalayan happiness and nacho vibes. Oh, my God. They're USD organic, gluten-free, kosher, vegan, non-GMO, no nuts, and no soy. And all I wanted was a chip, but they yeah. weren't special. Uh, and so I figured I'd try them, and they're actually not bad. Okay. Um, yeah, so we should really yeah. kind of wrap this up because it's so, really yeah. late anyways i don't know if but any yeah. of you had those but yeah uh, no. stacy's are pretty good but not all of them are non-gmo uh, okay i didn't know yeah i don't know what the claims on stacy's for gmo non-gmo at all yeah because they have some yeah I, i'm not sure they are pretty tasty the best are they the ones that made the cinnamon they made the cinnamon and sugar chips which i haven't had in years either that they were the best you could eat the whole bag you oh my goodness. dollar still store sells hot and honey cheese puffs. Uh, who's doing? Somebody's doing flaming hot 
Fritos? I saw a bag at uh, some event. Flaming Hot Fritos, I think. And they're like, I gotta try it. Two people, it was all people, it was a cocktail type thing or the event. Okay, None of us knew each other. Theory. And they, and one lady said to the other one, are you going to open those? She's like, yeah. She goes, can I try some? She's like, they grabbed them at this. I didn't try them. I was across the table. They were really fascinated by these like flaming hot Fritos. Okay. Let's end our conversation on junk food. Um, <laughs> ah, check peace on junk food. No, but all these different yeah. processed chips. Oh, they're stuff. highly processed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just go make some ketchup, add some extra sugar to it. <laughs> there you go. A little go. bit of fruit, a lot of sugar. Yep. Okay, guys. It, it, they have no, cheese puffs have no calories, just air. <laughs> but um, we got to cut it off for tonight because I am getting exhausted and I do have to work tomorrow morning. But we will have fun chatting with you guys next week. Um... Yeah, maybe, hopefully, we would have gone to the 4-H fair and seen some things, hopefully get some pictures. Hopefully, Saturday night. Yeah. It's probably, we're debating whether it was Monster Trucks or Demolition Derby. Probably I said, demolition. I think it's Demolition Derby It's Saturday night. They I don't, don't have a grandstand. They just have a hillside there. It's, I don't know it's, if they do Monster Trucks. They do. I think do that's they? on. Yeah, they okay. definitely do. Maybe Friday night. I um, think you can probably bring your local Monster Truck, too. And they all be local. It's a pretty small, it's a pretty... It's a kid-driven 4-H yeah. fair, so they don't have a monster grandstand. They don't have, like, have a, a massive, you know, country yeah. music act come in or anything. It's it's uh, They do a really nice job, but it, it's a very local. Yeah, but if I'm going to be awake to do that, I need good night's sleep all week. So we're going to say good night. <laughs> yep. uh, have a good night, you guys. We will definitely see you guys next weekend, 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time at Part-Time Permis. Talk to you later. Good night. Thanks for joining us.